Can we just put those up there one more time? And I just, I just want to sit there for a second. I'm not in a rush. I know it's Super Bowl Sunday, but the game doesn't start at, at, at noon or one, okay? We got a little bit of time. I know y'all got to make some chips and dips and some nachos and all that other good stuff, right? Huh? Hot wings. Hot wings. Yes, Lord Jesus. But we're going to cheer later for teams. But I would hate that if my cheering later for teams was louder than my cheering now for God. If I praised Patrick Mahomes or Jimmy Garoppolo more than I praised Jesus Christ. So you don't have to get up, but can we just sit in there for a moment? Because somebody needs that. Somebody needs those moments of just sitting there that you don't sometimes take in your everyday life to hold on to Jesus. Say you deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. I just need you, Jesus. Worthy is your name, yes. Jesus, you deserve. Worthy is your name. Say worthy. Worthy is you. Is he worth getting over your pride? Is he worth getting over your fear? Is he worth getting over yourself just to exalt him? Just worthy. Worthy is your name. Oh, you're worthy, Jesus. Oh, you're worthy, Jesus. One more time, no music. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. God, we just take a moment and we just serenade you. We serenade you like the actors in the old Shakespearean sonnets, God. We look up at you and we we proclaim your glory because you're worthy to have your glory proclaimed. You're worthy to be exalted. You're worthy to be lifted up. There is none like you. There are false gods and there are false religions, but then there is you and you are the true and living God. So we exalt you. We put you on the pedestal. We put you in your place. We ask that our praises truly be exalting to you, that they be a sweet aroma in your nostrils, that you would be pleased, that you would be glorified, that you would feel our love and our joy and the fact that we want you to be in the place you deserve to be yes. above all. Yes. So God, would you just take this time as our offering of praise? We don't always know how to show it. Sometimes we don't study the Bible enough. Sometimes we don't pray enough. Sometimes we don't praise enough. Oh God, but we love you. And I pray that you would work in us, work on us. Transform us, conform us in such a way that as we praise you every day, the pleasure you get from our praise grows. That we better know how to praise you, that we better know how to worship you, that we better know how to glorify you, that we better know how to exalt you, that we better know what truly pleases you. So God, we pray that as we spend this time in your word today, God, that it would be a part of that transforming, conforming process, that you would do the work of conforming us into the image of your son, Jesus. Do your will. Do as you please. Just God, we ask and beg that you would get the glory out of us. That you would get all of the glory and the honor and the praise. So Holy Spirit, hide me and exalt yourself. And uh, do whatever it is you want to do today. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Let's go. Y'all got the other mic. 
Um, guys, we, we just got out of a series last month and we were talking about rebounding and we got to get to the real stuff that the church is about. Amen. Um, I was in Los Angeles this week um, for most of the week. Uh, the One of the organizations we're part of called Converge um, was having their kind of big conference and it's called Unleash. And I was out there and I was taking the time to build some relationships, do some fundraising, things like that. But I had some time alone, which you don't always get. We know we're pretty busy in life, right? We don't always get that time to get alone and spend time with God. And in being able to do so, uh, the Lord was really able to speak into me and burst some things into me that are for our church. And uh, we are in a series right now that we're calling 2020 Vision. It's 2020 and we need 2020 vision in 2020, amen? We need to be able to do what Hebrews tells us when it says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, who for the joy before him endured the cross, right? We need to be able to see Jesus as a church. We need to know, okay, Jesus, what is the vision that you have for this church? How are we supposed to live? How are we supposed to live in this world? How are we supposed to act? How are we supposed to respond? What is our purpose? Amen. And I think that, that we need to realize that this is an important thing that we need to touch on every year because the Bible clearly says for a lack of vision, what? The people perish. That means when you don't have clear vision as to where you're going, sometimes people get disgruntled. Sometimes people fall to the side. Sometimes people fail because they're not all put on this singular purpose of going forward. We need to have a singular purpose as a church going forward. Amen. And so I want us to begin to deal with that 2020 vision. But before we do that, one of the things that, that I think the Lord gave me as I was out there, as I was, uh, I was sitting at the computer and I was writing on the plane and the Lord was like, you know, Terrence and, and, and some of the team are talking about, we need something that galvanizes us. And I'm like, okay. And I tried to write before and it wouldn't, it wouldn't come out. And so I'm spending time with the Lord and he just begins to pour this thing out. And what the Lord gave me is a, is, is a statement that we're going to say every week at this church that we're going to do together because we want to be on the same place. I never want somebody to come in here and leave and have a good time at service, but not know the purpose of our church. Amen. So we're going to clearly connect that. So I need y'all to stand up with me real quick. Can y'all stand up with me real quick? Every week from now on, we're going to put this in here and we're going to say it. It'll be different people saying it, but as a church, we're going to say this. And this is kind of our, our who is life point statement. So I need y'all to say this with me. Can y'all do that? Can y'all help me with this? We're going to do it on the count of three. Um, and it's one, two, three. We are life point church. Our goal is that both you and I learn to live a life filled with the faith joy, victory, and purpose that produces a fruitful life. We believe that this can only happen when we learn to let Jesus have full control of our lives. For this reason, we serve God sacrificially, honor God firstly, invest in what God is doing, follow God's word obediently, and trust God faithfully. We do this because we know and believe that it is only when we place God at the center of everything that we begin to move in God God's power and understand the real point for our lives. Amen. This is something we're going to say every week and we're going to get this in our spirit because we don't want people to come in here and wonder what the church is about. We want them to be clear. We want them to be able to count the cost. We want people to understand who is this church? We are a church of people um, that we want to let Jesus have full control. How do we do that? We, we, we serve God sacrificially, honor God firstly, invest in what God is doing, follow God's word and trust God faithfully. That's what we're going to do. That's how we're going to grow in the Lord. Amen. So that's something we're going to do weekly and I want y'all to see it. I want y'all to get used to it. You guys can go ahead and be seated, but I want you to understand that that's what we're going to do. That's how we're going to be reminded weekly of our purpose in God. Amen. So as we go into our 2020 vision, I think we need to unpack over this month, who is life point. Okay. And one of the ways we do that, that's a statement that kind of makes clear what we're doing, but what is our mission statement? How can we have a simple, succinct statement that allows people to understand who life point is? And if you don't know, this is the mission of life point church. You can go ahead and put it up there, Amanda. Thank you so much. It says this, we exist to help people find victory and life by pointing them to Christ. 
Just that quick, that, that simple, we exist to help people find victory and life by pointing them to Christ. It's short, it's clear, it's to the point. We, have, we exist to help people find victory in life. How? By pointing them to Christ. Amen? That is the mission of Life Point Church. We can get outside of all the other stuff. Everything else we do, that's on the side. This is the main purpose for which we exist. And so this month I wanted to unpack this. And today the first way we're going to unpack this is we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to preach through this mission statement. Is that okay? I want to make very clear what this means. And so guys, if you have your Bible, I need you to go ahead and open it up to Colossians chapter one, verse 15 and 16. Colossians 1, 15 and 16. When you get there, go ahead and say amen. Amen. Come on, when y'all get there. Well, Colossians 1, 15 and 16. All right. It's right after Philippians, right? So go ahead. Get past Philippians. Colossians chapter 1. We're going to say it again. I want y'all with me. I want y'all flipping. Some of y'all don't flip your Bible that much during the week, and we're going to grow in that. Amen? We're going to grow. If you got an app and you ain't there yet... Is problem. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just messing. <laughs> I'm just messing. Um, come on. Colossians 1, 15 and 16. And it reads as follows. He is. Who is the he is? Jesus. Jesus. Let's talk about this mission statement. The first thing that we're going to talk about about this mission statement is it says we exist. Those are the first two words of our of our mission statement. We exist. Say it with me. We exist. Say it again. We exists. I want y'all to understand something. I think sometimes we don't take enough time to slow down and ponder things anymore. There used to be people that were in the world and they were so philosophical, they would sit down and they would just sit like this all day and just think and come up with stuff. We don't even want to slow down. That's why we try to multitask everything. You can just scroll through your emails real quick, but sometimes we need to slow down and ponder our existence as people, as individuals, as, 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 and, and if you do that, you begin to realize something. Colossians 1, 15 and 16 is a great couple verses that help us understand the purpose for our existence. It starts with he is. Our existence does not start with us. It starts with he. Who is that he? Jesus, God, yes. He, I want you to understand something. Our existence in this world is not about ourselves. It's about God. We don't exist outside of God. We don't exist except for God. One of the biggest problems that people have in this world is that they try to live for themselves about their own agenda as if the world revolves around them. But the truth is this, the world doesn't revolve around you. It doesn't revolve around me. The world revolves around God himself, amen? And so if we want to talk about the existence of us as individuals and as a church, it starts with a focus on God. 1, 15 and 6 says, he is the image of the invisible God. What that literally means is this. If you want to see the God who is spirit, then you look directly at the God who is Jesus. Amen. God exists eternally as three persons. One essence, we call that the Trinity. There is Father, Son and Spirit. When you see Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, what you are seeing is the evidence and the reality of who God is that could not be seen now being able to be seen in Jesus. The uh, Hebrew says he is the radiance of his glory. Okay? That means if you want to see the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, anything that represents God, you look at Jesus and you're able to see the Father in it. Amen? He is the, watch this. The visible, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, somebody say by him. For by him all things were created. What does all things mean? All, right, yeah, that's that, all. That means that there was nothing that has ever been created that was not created by Jesus, amen? We need to be very clear on that point because it says this, in heaven and on earth, visible or and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and what? Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. One more time, say it again. I want you to realize this, we exist what? Yes, that's it. We exist for him and we need to begin to understand that. The church is not a place that is supposed to revolve around what you desire and what you like. The, the, the level of music you like, how loud you want it, what kind of like, all of this. This is not about you and it's not about me. It's about Jesus. The church was created by Jesus for Jesus. Amen? Amen. 
So that means that if we exist by Jesus and for Jesus, we should live by Jesus and for Jesus, correct? Do y'all get that? That means that as we do church and plot church and plan church, if it's not by him, which means we're led by him, we're doing it through him, then we're not really doing it for him. Does that make sense? And there's no, here's the reality. There is no reason for us to exist as a church if we're not being used by him for him. That's a deep statement. We don't need to be here if we're not living by him for him. If, if this church is not being used by Jesus for his purposes, we can shut the doors down and figure it out. But we don't need to be here. And that is the truth. That's why in our mission statement, the, the, the first thing is we exist. We need to realize we exist for Jesus. Amen? If we are not attempting to fulfill our purpose, then we have no reason to be here. That's the first thing. We exist. So the first part of our mission statement is what? We exist. All right? Let's go to the second part of our, our mission statement. The second part of our mission statement, it says what? Say it again. Say it again. I want y'all to get this in your spirit. We exist by Jesus and for Jesus, and thus, the way that Jesus wants to use us is to what? Somebody needs to realize that. I understand that we have problems and we have issues, we have concerns, there are things that go on in our life, but the true reality of life is that God has put us here to help people. It's not about your wants, it's not about your desires. If you are only focusing on yourself, then you're not really focusing on Jesus. We don't like that. Because we want everything centered around us, right? We go to restaurants and the slogans are, have it your way, right? We want things our way. But the reality is Jesus is trying to get us to be a church that's not focused just on our way, that's really focused on his way and his desires, his heart, his wants. And what does Jesus desire? He desires for us to do what? To help people. I need you to go ahead if you got your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 25. Y'all gonna have to use it today. Come on, we're gonna have to use it. Matthew chapter 25, okay? When y'all get there, I need you to say amen. I, this, this is an important sermon because we're talking about who we are. We don't need to go forward if we don't all clearly know where we are. Jesus says count the cost before you build a house, right? Because you don't want to look like a fool after you got halfway through with the house and what happens? You don't have enough to finish it. We, we want, I want you to, Jesus has always been honest. Jesus don't say the nice stuff all the time. Does he, I, can't, I did not come to bring peace but a sword. What do you do if somebody come to your dinner and they say, I did not come to bring peace but a sword? You're like, uh... That's a little uncomfortable, right? Jesus was honest though, wasn't he? So we have to be honest as a church and say, what are we here for? We exist, the first thing, to help people. Matthew chapter 25, starting at verse 35. If you disagree, then help me understand this. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. And I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when we, did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. I think that's a very clear thing from Jesus. Watch this. When you help people, you're serving Jesus. When you don't help people, you're not serving Jesus. Let me say it again. When you help people, what are you doing? You're serving Jesus. When you don't help people, you're not serving Jesus. Let's say that again. When you help people, you're serving Jesus. When you don't help people, you're not serving Jesus. That's a pretty clear statement, isn't it? Disagree? Maybe we should go on just a little bit further. In verse 41, it says, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer saying, Lord, when did we not see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, 
Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. That's the Bible, that's not Max, okay? That's Jesus making the point that when you've met Jesus and you've submitted your life to Jesus, you live for the purposes of Jesus and that is to help people. It's pretty clear, ain't it? If you are not living a life surrendered where you're willing to help people, then guess what? You may not have really had an interaction with Jesus because he's making it clear. Jesus is drawing a line in the sand and saying, there is evidence of the fruit of salvation. You live a life that's not just concerned with you. you, you think of others more highly than you think of yourself. You see the purposes of God and say, I need to help people because my burdens are fueled by Jesus. Does that make sense to you guys? We have to become people who are committed to that. As the people of God, we have a responsibility to do our part to serve in such a way that we help people more easily see Jesus. There is no service that is too large or small. We should be willing to undertake and fill in the gaps in any way that will assist in escorting someone closer to Jesus. Does that make sense? We must serve in such a way so selflessly that people can see the love of Christ and be drawn nearer to him. Amen? That means that, guess what? Some of y'all have come in the doors of the church broken before, come in the doors hurting, come through with problems, and guess what? You know the worst thing that can happen in those situations is when people come in and there's no one there willing to smile with the love of Jesus. And it's a shame that in a church of people, it don't matter if we have two or 200, if we don't have people who are even willing to go out in the parking lot and smile at somebody and greet somebody with the love of Jesus, there's a problem in the church. There is nothing too small. I tell people here, I may be the pastor. Do you know what the real job description for the pastor is? Toilet cleaner, janitor, mop hand. Okay, think about those things. Trash picker upper, because there's nothing too small. If me getting in here and cleaning something allows a, a, a less intrusions and less obstacles for someone to come in and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, then there is nothing that is beneath me. Nothing. And when will we as the people of God get to the point that we say we need to get out our own feelings, get out our own flesh, and get up and serve Jesus faithfully? Amen? That is who we are. We exist to help people. We help people through serving. We must serve the least of these, the brokenhearted. It also means that when we go outside this building, we gotta be people that serve. It's not just about you coming here and serving at the church, but we live our lives to serve and to bless others. And let me tell you the truth, the reason a lot of people aren't blessed is because the greatest blessings come out of you becoming a blessing, not by you getting handed a blessing. Amen? You know when you, know when you feel less broken? When even in your broken state, you go out and you surrender yourself to be used by God. And he does something powerful in somebody else's life and you realize that no matter how down in the dumps I can be, God can still use me. That's when you get blessed in life. That's when you find out the strength of God and the identity that you have in Jesus Christ. Amen? That's the second thing. The first thing is we exist. The second part is to help people. So how are we exactly helping people in the way that God is moving us forward as a church. Let's go to number three, to find victory and life. Somebody say victory and say life. Say it again, victory and life. Guys, I want you to understand this. We aren't just, we, we need to go out and help people in every way we can. He said this in all of those different ways that he listed in that verse, you, you help the least of these, you're helping me. You're serving me, right? But specifically as a church, what are we trying to do? We're trying to help people find victory and life. Here's the truth for you guys. If everyone in the world actually and really understood what it meant to reside in Christ and dwell in Christ and live in Christ, then the truth is that everyone would want to stand in Christ. If people actually knew the truth that we have been so graciously given, it would be uh, unthinkable. They wouldn't even think about it, they would run to it. 
If somebody says, hey, just go stand next to this guy and they'll give you a million dollars, everybody in the room is going to be standing around that person because it's a simple thing to see that what they're offering is so great and if all I got to do is this, then guess what? That's what I'm going to do. The same truth is Jesus offers more than the millionaire who you can stand next to. Jesus offers eternal life. He offers joy where there was brokenness. He offers love and happiness. He offers blessings. He offers eternity. If people actually understood who Jesus was and what he offered, do you think it would resist? No. They would be drawn to it. They would run to it. But the truth is not only do a lot of the people in the world not understand what Jesus offers, I hate to tell you, that a lot of people in the church don't actually understand what Jesus offers. I want you to think about that. How many of us, we came to Jesus because we made big mistakes? Anybody come to Jesus because they felt down in the dumps and guilty about the life that they had lived or something they had done? Somebody woke up in the bed with somebody one morning and they felt regret. Somebody drank too much the night before and they made regret. Somebody mismanaged their money, made a big mistake. Somebody had an abortion. Somebody had a bad breakup. Somebody went through something. It's not until often that we, we realize the, the depths of our brokenness and how depraved we can be sometimes that we realize our need for, for Jesus, right? Isn't that true? That it's hard to see Jesus and know Jesus until you understand that sin is a part of you. And I understand that. But the reality is that many of us only really accepted him because we wanted a rescue from the punishments that came because of the mistakes that we made. How many of y'all hear the gospel preached and they say, guess what? You can be, you can be saved from hell, Right? You can be saved from hell. If you accept Jesus, he saves you from hell. And so the problem is that so many people in the church focus on the fact that when Jesus does his work on the cross, it saves you from hell, that they forget to focus on the most beautiful part, that he doesn't just save you from something, he saves you to something. And that's a reality we cannot forget. Jesus saves us to something. Many of us, God is only good enough to save us from hell. But then we compartmentalize our spiritual life and only talk about Jesus or bring Jesus into the parts of our life when we're trying to show off in front of other people. That's the truth. The truth is we need to know what Jesus offers. Living in Christ is not just about receiving and being free from an eternal punishment. Jesus says these words in John 10, 10. I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Let me say that again. He says that he came that they may have what? And have it what? So why aren't more people enjoying life and having it more abundantly? That is what we want people to understand when we talk about we exist to help people find victory and life. We exist to help people find what Jesus came to bring. It's just that simple. But I want to define some things for you. What do I mean by victory? Let's go ahead and put that up on here. When I talk about victory, what I'm saying is this. Victory means embracing your gospel-given identity in Christ and then harnessing the positive and powerful implications of that identity in every area and aspect of your life. Here is the reality. Most people view salvation in Christ as a destination. But guess what? It's not just a destination it's also something that produces something when you understand the true power that is contained in the gospel truth that you live in because you live in Jesus now lives in you here's the reality it's going to produce some things the Bible says every tree bears fruit what according to its kind that means if you're a good tree you're going to have some good fruit right but if you're a bad tree you're going to have some what bear fruit. In Christ, God begins to bear fruit in us in different ways, but that fruit is defined. The problem for many of us is we don't live fruit-filled lives. Why? Because we've never actually learned what it means to take the truth of the gospel and apply it to the areas of our life. 
When the gospel gets involved in your marriage, it changes how a wife treats a husband and how a husband treats a wife. When the gospel gets involved in your parenting, it changes how a parent treats a child. When the gospel gets involved in a child, it changes how the child treats the parent. When the gospel gets involved in your work habits, it changes how you serve and you do everything unto the glory of the Lord and it produces fruit. When the gospel gets into your finances, God begins to have you interact with money in such a certain way that you don't worship it, you use it for his glory. When God allows the gospel to take hold, when that happens, big things can happen. But the problem is that most of us never actually figure out how to put the gospel in areas of our life because all we're happy is that we got out of jail free. If that's all that the gospel is, then one day we'll get to heaven and God will say, that's what you get. You got in. You got your admission. Here's a free ticket. Now go sit down. That's not what God came to bring us to. He came us to bring us to something deeper. That's where we need to understand that, guess what? In Christ, we are given victory, but we're also given life. And I want you to go to this definition of life. What, what is the life that he came to bring? He wants us living a new life in Christ where you discover your unique makeup, your personality, your gifting and placement in order to better understand who God made you and how he desires to use you to bring life in Jesus to others. Others. That's what I need y'all to realize. You ain't living if you're just living for yourself. You're not living if you're just living for your own priorities. You're not living if you're just living for your own desires. All you're doing is just spinning down the toilet bowl. That's the truth. You don't understand new life until you understand a Jesus purposed life. Why? Because everything that you desire and everything that you live for, the toys, the cars, the money, the clothes, all of this stuff, we work every day for retirement just to put up a retirement fund. And one day, everything that we will do will fade away. That's not life. That's a path to death. It will end. But in Jesus, we find things that last eternally. Guess what? You can spend your whole life laboring for something that will go away that you can't take to the grave or you can spend your life laboring for something that the grave can't stop. Which will you do? Jesus Christ has given you new life in him when you believe in his death on the cross. He's also implanted the Holy Spirit into you. He's also equipped you with gifts. And what he wants you to do is understand that guess what? I remade you. I equipped you and I placed you where you are so that I can get the glory out of you where I placed you. He put you in the marriage that you're in so that you, he can get the glory out of it. He put you in the family you're in so he can get the glory out of it. He put you in the job you're in so he can get the glory out of it. He put you in the house you're in so you can get the glory out of it. He put you in the neighborhood you're in so he can get the glory out of it. He put you and placed you and equipped you for his purposes. But the problem is most people can't get outside of themselves. But here, our goal is to help people find victory in life. Victory in life. Victory in life. You know why victory was so important that God made me put it in there? Because I've seen a whole lot of downtrodden people. A whole lot of people who stopped trying and really stopped living and were only living to die because they were so distraught and disgusted at the hand that life had dealt them. Sometimes we can get so beat up and battered and bruised by life that we don't want to keep fighting, but Jesus Christ gives us new fight. We don't have to stay downtrodden. We don't have to stay broken. We are the redeemed of the Lord. We are more than conquerors. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. That is who we are. And it's, if we don't start living like that, we don't show others how to live like that. Sometimes you gotta get up, brush off, keep walking, put your head up and keep trekking forward because you know that God wants to use you to show that same quality in somebody else. That's what he wants. And that's who we have to be. We are meant to bring victory and life to people. We need to stop shooting for just good things and good dreams and start shooting for God dreams. Somebody needs to realize that he has greater desires for your life than you do, okay? He has greater desires for your marriage than you do. He's got greater desires for your children than you do. He's got greater desire for your resources than you do. He's just got greater desires for every part of your life than you do. And we gotta be a part of just partnering with him in that. 
That's why in Proverbs it says, in Proverbs 13, 22, it says this, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up. We're sitting here, what kind of inheritance are we leaving to our children? What kind? The last part I'm gonna give y'all is not only are we here to help people find victory in life, but there's a way that we gonna do it. We do it pointing people to Christ. I'm gonna simply say it like this. We cannot have the victory and purpose that Christ desires for us unless we go to Christ to get it. It's just that simple. We cannot have the victory and life that Jesus desires for us unless we go to Jesus to get it. Here's the reality. How many people watching the old network trying to figure out what life is all about? Let's, let's be for real. How many people are on their Kindle looking at every self-help book trying to figure out what life is all about? How many people by going to every marriage seminar or every finance class trying to figure out how to manage this stuff? The reality is this, the only person that can fix anything is the only person that can fix everything and the only person that can do all of that is named Jesus. Jesus is the one. I know y'all bored, I'm sorry. I'm sorry y'all bored. Because that's the reality. As a church, we exist to help people find victory and life by pointing them to Christ. Jesus says, it, when I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. The person that's lying in drugs, when Jesus is lifted up, he can draw that person on drugs to them. The alcoholic who lives in the bottle, when, that, when Jesus is lifted up, he can draw them to him. The person who's lost in pornography or lost in being a sex addict, that's what, when Jesus is lifted up, he can draw them to him. The marriage that's broken, when Jesus is lifted up, he can draw them to him. The child that's broken, the child that's hurting, guess what? But when Jesus is lifted up, he can draw them to him. We got to believe it. We got to live it. We got to push for it. We got to share it day in and day out. Day in and day out. That's the reality of it, guys. That's what we exist for. Go to 1 Peter. You don't believe me? Before we get out of here, go to 1 Peter. Chapter 2. 1 Peter. And when you get to 1 Peter chapter 2, I want to show you this beautiful passage written by Pre Peter as we talk about our purpose. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 9, he says this, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Why? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who call you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Guess what? What he's saying is this. Guess what? You who were once in the dark, you who were once lost in brokenness, you who were once lost to yourself, you who were once lost to the world was sitting in the corner in the dark and Jesus called you out and he called you out to call others out. Are you still just focused on yourself? He says this, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. He says this, beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Then he gets this, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Why? So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Literally, he's saying this, you need to not only be able to share it, but you need to be able to show it. You need to be able to live in such a way that when the people who don't know God see how you know God, they want to know God and they give him glory. That's what we're for. But that also means we can't just do it inside of four walls. Just because we got a building don't mean we made it. It just means we got a building. It means we got a, a rent to pay and bills to pay. That's not the important stuff. You know, it's, it's funny. The Lord hit me with this. Yeah, we asked for tithes and offering. But if we go do what we're supposed to do, we ain't going to have to worry about that. 
we go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ, meet people in the streets, meet them where they are, meet them in their brokenness, meet them in their lost them, show them the love of Christ, let them see an example of what somebody who believes and is redeemed and is living in the spirit of God looks like. We're not going to have to worry about that because God has never left the righteous forsaken, forsaken or seen them what? Begging for bread. All we got to do is what we're supposed to do, which is the vision of this church. And if we're not doing what we're supposed to do, then we really have no reason to be here anyway. Y'all get that? If we're not going to do what we're supposed to do, then there's no reason to keep doing what we're doing. That's the truth. We're going to stop playing church like we play in house. We're going to start being the church. We're going to start living as the church. We're going to start loving as the church. We're going to start serving as the church. Why? Because when the church, uh, God starts doing that, people want to know Jesus. God placed us on one of the busiest streets in the area. Why? Just so we could put a sign outside? So that we could live by the field of dreams model? If you build it, they will come. Instagram ain't going to do it, y'all. Facebook Live ain't going to do it. God uses people. Can he use platforms and social media? Yeah, but you know what God uses to save people? People. And that's the beauty of purpose. We lived for ourselves and we're doing nothing more than living for the grave. And God takes us and he pulls us out of these obscure, purposeless lives. And he says, go and be fishers of men. Start doing something that has eternal purpose. But if all we're going to do is stay inside of here and play church, be about ourselves, not even be willing to get two people in the parking lot on a week to greet somebody at the door. God, we haven't even been able to get somebody to greet somebody in the parking lot. You ever think that maybe if you ran out there with the umbrella on the rainy day and put the umbrella over the lady, not knowing that she was broken and what she was going through, she might, that just might be the very thing that helps her see the love of God and makes her receptive when the gospel is shared. We have to be the church. Just, you don't come to church. You are the church. You live as the church. You serve as the church. You love as the church because the church is the people. So as this gathering of living stones, because that's what Peter would later say, he said, we are living stones. And it's those living stones that make up the church. We exist to help people find victory in life by pointing them to Christ. Will you be about the mission with us? Because here's the truth, for a lack of vision, the people perish. But if we clearly state the vision, clearly work the vision, clearly live the vision, and you don't want to be about the vision, then God has given clear indicators that you need to go find another vision to sit under. I said this to them earlier, when I say what I'm about to say, it's not meant in offense. I'm, I'm, I'm a person that struggles with dad issues sometimes. I didn't have one, so I had to learn what being a father is. And God has made me a father in this house. He is our father, but he has made me a father in this house. And so as a father in this house, these are the words that I leave us with. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm making that my statement in my own home, but I'm making that our statement here. We will serve the Lord. It's going to involve us growing. It's going to be painful sometimes because growing pains hurt. But if we're willing to do it, one day we'll see something very special. 
we'll get to heaven and Jesus will be coming around and he'll just be be handing out crowns. And to the people who only lived to escape hell, he'll stop in front of them and go, you only lived to escape hell, so you have your reward. But to the people who lived for his glory, to see him exalted, to see him lifted up, to see the guest list to heaven expanded and people to know Jesus and their lives to come under his rule and dominion, he's going to begin to hand out crowns. Don't be empty handed in heaven because you tried to hold on to everything else on earth. But you, what will you do? It's your choice. Let's pray. Father God, we just come before you right now and we just ask that as we try to clearly communicate this vision of who we are as a church, when it gets down to everything else, God, we exist to help people find victory and life by pointing them to Christ. Our prayer is that you would use us in ways we cannot fathom or imagine to do what we could not do in our own power to impact eternity. And so we laid us at your hands. Laid us at your feet. We say we are not our own, but we are yours. Use us as you see fit. Glory to yourself. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. That is the beginning of the vision of who we are as a church. We exist to help people find victory and life by pointing them to Christ. Over the next few weeks, we're gonna to begin to share what that's going to look like in the year 2020 and how we see God wanting and desiring to use us to change this neighborhood, to change our communities, to change our families, to change lives by introducing them to Jesus, amen? Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed that video. If you would like to see more, please visit our website at lifepointcc.org, where we are believing in God to have a life-changing message waiting for you.